you know, the origin of humans has always been one of the major questions that people have posed, really. You know, it's like, what's the origin of the earth? Why am I here? And, you know, where did we come from? And uh, so there have been a, a few different hypotheses proposed, let's say. Um, Adam, and Eve, Adam and Eve Gardner uh, would be one of those uh, hypotheses, of course, uh, predating Adam and Eve, of course, uh, Fred and Wilma Flintstone lived in Bedrock. And then uh, I, maybe you don't know this one, but Aliyup, Ula, and Denny, the, uh, the dinosaur that they were riding there, uh, were also uh, in the comic pages as well. Uh, but what we do know, in fact, is that we are animals. We're chordates, we're mammals, we're our primates, in fact. And so primates would go all the way back to things like lemurs and eye eyes and and unusual sorts of things that lived in, um, in sort of tropical settings, I guess you could say. And so those primates, uh, well, in, the, in this slide, you can actually see the baboons are primates. And, of course, the old world monkeys, of course, uh, as well. And then uh, we have all of these other sorts of um, creatures that are in our tree. The gibbons, the orangutans, the, uh, the uh, gorillas, and then the bonobos and the chimpanzee are all part of our uh, sort of uh, lineage, if you will. It's not really a direct line lineage, but we share common characteristics with these. And then amongst those, uh, we have the hominidae. And so that would be the great apes, in fact. And so um, the hominini would include the gorillas. And then the hominini, uh, the pan, would be the chimpanzees. And so it shows some of the... the um, range of different varieties of great apes that there are. And of course, down here at the bottom, I show uh, former President Reagan and then also a hobbit, uh, which is a uh, recently discovered um, humanoid uh, skull from the island of Flores, I think it is, in Indonesia. And uh, so we all share a common characteristics. So we have opposable thumbs. We have Okay, some of us have prehensile tails. They usually snip those off right after you're born. Um, but, you know, no, 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 I'm kidding. Some people are born with tails, okay, just so that you know. Um, you can look it up on the Internet. It must be correct then, right? So uh, prehensile tails are ones that can actually be articulated and be useful for climbing and hanging in trees and things like that. So prosimians are more like the lemur-type sorts of uh, animals if if you will, and then the simians are the monkey-like animals, and the simians are divided into the old world, new world monkeys, and they are thought to have crossed the Atlantic about 40 million years ago uh, at some point, so that predates Columbus significantly, and 40 million years they could have rafted uh, across perhaps, but uh, they made South America, in fact, so uh, remember that things spread apart, but it wasn't all that far apart necessarily, so I don't know that what what the new world and old world monkey, you know, um, status is right now. But uh, it's something worth looking into if you have an interest in this sort of thing. Uh, hominids, we have large, uh, mostly tailless, and <laughs> omnivores. Uh, there's sexual dimorphism. Uh, in other words, there are two different sizes and shapes, essentially, for males and females uh, within the uh, hominid, hominid, hominid uh, species. And then, of course, the living ones, of course, would include humans, us, and gorillas and chimps and bonobos, or pan is the uh, genus, and orangutans. Um, so the chimps use tools. They laugh. They mourn. They, they, they mourn the deaths of, of those around them in their tribes. And so they have, and young chimps are actually typically very smart, and they're able to outsmart really a typical four-year-old human. So humans have the capacity, of course, to, you know, gain knowledge and then to apply that knowledge uh, with our massive sort of uh, cerebral capacities. And so um, in the next slide, you can actually see the, the proposed lineages for many of the um, human species here. And uh, it shows you it starts all the way back here with... Uh, uh, well, Artiopithecus is one of the, the common ones, okay? So people found that recently here. There's some older varieties too, like uh, I'm not really familiar with this. I think if you were to take a course in anthropology, you'd be well served to look at some of the earlier species, genus and species of, of hominids. Uh, and there are gaps. There are gaps. So if we go back 
six million years, that's a long ways, right? So, but, but modern humans, ourselves, really go back about 200,000 years. So roughly 200,000 years we've been around our species. And there were other um, allied species that are in our same branch, if you will, that would go back to the, uh, the Homo habilis and then the Homo rudol rudolfensis and then the Homo aerogaster and then the Homo erectus pretty much made it around the world, except for the new world. Okay, so everywhere in the old world, in Africa and Asia and places like that, Homo erectus was there. And that was about a million and a half years ago. So that is the, uh, the family tree, more or less. So let me just show you some postcards from these long dead relatives now that we still, you know, we, we actually, human beings have a little bit of um, Neanderthal DNA. We have up to 3% uh, Neanderthal DNA. And uh, folks who study these sorts of uh, uh, genetics, they will claim that if you took all of those sort of like snippets of uh, DNA from the uh, Neanderthals, that we would be able to uh, piece together about 80% of, of the Neanderthal uh, uh, genome. So pretty interesting that way. Um, okay, what else? Uh, so we have... Uh, Australopithecus, this is one of the earliest ones found three to four million years ago, Afarensis. Uh, the Afar Triangle is where that's named for. So the African Rift Valleys are really important in human evolution. Uh, Australopithecus uh, africensis uh, uh, from South Africa as well. There are skull changes. You can kind of see some of these changes here uh, in, the, in the cranium. Uh, there's a child down here as well. Uh, other ones that we have are pro- Anthropus, uh, or Paraanthropus, a cross Anthropus, and uh, Ethiopicus, and so that's from the Transvaal as well down in South Africa. Uh, just shows you some of the characteristics of some of these creatures. Paranthropus robustus is the next on the on this list of, of uh, family history here, if you will. Uh, and again, we only have shared common ancestry. It is not a direct line, linear, uh, linear sort of like tree that we're talking about here. Uh, protruding eyebrows uh, were one of the things that people have, uh, you know, that still have some of us. And, and it's like, you know, that's, um, it's just part of being human, maybe, you know, so it protects our eyes that way. And so, you know, the high forehead is one of the more uh, recent developments in time. But uh, Paranthropus uh, robustus did not have a high forehead, but had the protruding eyebrows. Um, Homo naledi, uh, they pieced one of the most complete uh, skeletons of those. Um, this family member back from uh, 2013, they discovered it was published in 2015. And it was buried. Some of these skeletons were buried with actual, and yeah, this goes back three million years, with uh, things that would be uh, would 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 symbolize that they had a sort of family or a tribal sort of structure anyway. Uh, in the next uh, diagram, it shows you where they found this in a in a cave, and um, again, it's uh, you know three million years old in Africa, and uh, this would be um, you know kind of neat where they they've shown you. Well, this is taken directly from uh, the publication that uh, talks about the discovery here. Um, many of the early human beings, of course, lived in caves. And of course, we still live in caves in many ways, right? Either apartment buildings, which are multi, you know, uh, chambered cave, if you will. Even houses are multi-chambered. So we have that sort of distinction. You know, we, we build our own caves now. But that's the only difference, really. <laughs> the way we get around is a little bit different than we used to, right? We used to hang out in the trees first, right? You know, so we lived in the savannas and we're able to get away from at least some of the cats that way, uh, from being uh, eaten alive by lions and, and, and panthers and that sort of thing uh, by going up in the trees. But, you know, at the same time, we were able to come down and then hunt at some point. Uh, so the stone tools is kind of a landmark uh, thing about human beings in our tree um, and, and, and the ancestors that we would have, the common ancestry that we had, some of those early species would be able to do things like that. So here's the next slide right here. You can see Homo habilis, uh, Homo erectus, and then you can see Homo florensis. And that's the ones they call the hobbit. In fact, those are the ones that were discovered recently in a cave 
in uh, Indonesia. And so they're a, a small people. Uh, they would have been uh, very, very small, but there are a lot of things that can give small stature to uh, humans. In fact, m much of it's nutrition related, in fact. Uh, if you look at the very end, then there's Homo naledi. Um, and so these are, we're, we're getting closer, I guess, up to modern humans, I guess you could say here. Uh, in the Olduvai Gorge, those uh, sediments were dated uh, with uh, the ashes and 2.5 and 1.9 million years ago. So Homo habilis, one of the early uh, hominids. And then uh, from the joints, we, you know, be, people became more, um, we were able to climb, we would do all these other sorts of things, but then they became larger, I guess you could say at some point. And so uh, eventually when the, uh, uh, Homo erectus gave rise to some of the later, like the Heidelbergensis and so forth. They were larger peoples at that time then. Not larger than what they are today, but larger than uh, what these earlier uh, hominids were like. And uh, so we have um, Homo ergaster. Uh, this is found in Africa, Europe, and Asia. Most of these are you know, thought to give rise, in fact, to you know, Homo erectus here. Most of these, in fact, are... Uh, they would have wandered out of Africa, but really the modern humans ourselves, our lineage would have stayed in Africa. So we don't really have necessarily shared common ancestry with the other wider distribution in the European and Asian sort of areas with Homo ergaster, other than we have shared common ancestry. So Homo erectus is next, and it would have had the prominent eyebrows as well. A sulcus is the uh, sort of like divot, if you will, between the brows. And they had a forehead, right? So uh, not quite as high as modern humans, but here they are. And they were adapted for walking upright. And so once things come out of the trees, and so we wouldn't be a direct line lineage uh, sort of uh, character with this, at least not the ones found in Asia here. Uh, but uh, the modern humans actually came out of Africa about 60,000 years ago or, or so. And well, here's one that came out in 125 to 800,000 years ago. But then again, we don't think that we have direct lineage uh, with the Heidelbergensis. And so um, it, the story's a little different for Neanderthals, however. So they came out somewhere between 30 and 200,000 years ago. And we have shared common ancestry with the Neanderthals. And in 3% three, 3 of our genome, up to 3% of our genome can be Neanderthal as well. Uh, they find higher percentages of that in the east. So in South Asia and East Asia, you'll find not only a higher proportion of Neanderthal, but also of uh, Denosovans. And so Denosovans are another early human uh, sort of species, if you will, and just snippets. And so the nice thing is that what it shows is that we interbred <laughs> as modern humans inter interbred with these uh, earlier hominids like this. So it's like it's not... Uh, it's not, you know, there's this propensity to think that there's such a thing as purity. That's crazy. It's, it's like there's no such thing as racial purity or human purity or anything like that. We bred with anything that was out there pretty much. And so um, modern human beings, homo sapiens, had sex with Neanderthals. Okay, so that's that's what it boils down to. Um and so what that means, okay, there's a couple things like uh, Margaret Mead. I don't know if you've heard of her or not, but she is a very prominent um, anthropologist. And so they asked her one time, it's like, you know, what, what it really is it that makes us so special as human beings? And it's like, and is, is it the tools? Is it the cerebral sort of development? What, it, what is it that really makes humans so special? And she pondered this and said, you know what really makes us special is the fact that they have found bones of the early hominids where you could see that there was maybe a broken leg or a broken arm or something like that that would have been, I think it was a broken leg, where it would have killed that person. And in fact, there's evidence from the healed injury that this was somebody who was taken care of. And so you can actually, you know, say this like, so the most important thing that human beings carry as a trait is compassion, human compassion for one another. And so when it means that there was a tribal network 
that would have been a survival mechanism for somebody you know who would have been special in that tribe to be carried along uh, without necessarily pulling their weight in hunting or gathering or any of those other sort of uh, functions. So uh, that's what she said. Her name was Margaret Reed, uh, Margaret Mead, and so. Um, so if we get into Neanderthals, they find Neanderthals in uh, the Middle East. They find them in Europe, of course. They find them in Central Asia. They're found in uh, China as well. And so uh, here's just a few skeleton, uh, skeletal remains of skulls and so forth. They find a lot of these, okay? So it's not as though um, that these things were, you know, just a different bunch of people around. Although we're related, you know, there is only 3% of our DNA that's in common. Uh, but many of these are found uh, in the peripheral areas where the Ice Ages, they would have been up against the Ice Ages. And many people think that Neanderthals had a, a propensity, the very strong structural uh, uh, skeletons that these would have been hunters, of course, and that they could have hunted the megafauna without any problems. And in fact, they find... Um, projectile points, they find spear points, in fact, in the bones and scrapers associated with some of the megafauna uh, skeletons that have been found as well. And they find, you know, like knife marks and things like that on some of the bones that shows that there was butchering and that sort of thing that, that allowed these folks to survive. Of course, only in the old world. And uh, so this is the Homo Neanderthal from the late Pleistocene here. From uh, discovered 1908, 1909, people were big into finding fossils back then. So Homo sapiens came around. Well, one of the estimates is, and I, it, some people draw this all the way back to about 200,000 years ago when the Neanderthals were here, but then we overlap with Neanderthals, and so some people say about 100,000 years was roughly the start of the modern uh, human lineages, and that would have been in Africa, and so. One of, the, one of the things that people do when you're an anthropologist is they measure things, right? And so they, they measure the cranial capacity, for instance, and, and actually Neanderthals were slightly larger than uh, the modern humans. Um, and so there's not a, a strong correlation between intelligence and cranial capacity, although there is a correlation between, um, in general, I guess you could say general, you know, having a larger brain case helps make make it possible for you to know more, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, but that's what, there was a book written about that. It was called The Mismeasure of Man by Stephen Jay Gould. And so just because the brain size, you know, the brain potentially could be larger within the skull doesn't mean that anybody's necessarily smarter. Um, it's the connections you make, in fact, that make you smart. It's like how well your hemispheres are connected or how big your corpus callosum is. And so that's what really makes the connections in your brain and makes you, you know, quick on your feet or whatever. Um, so it's, that's Homo sapiens from about 130,000 years ago. There's really no such thing as race. You know, people will dispute, uh, dis dispute this perhaps, but um, race is an artificial concept in many ways. Um, the idea that we have different skin colors across humanity, uh, even the earliest uh, folks that came to Europe had dark skin and they find the remains of these folks and they know the genetic makeup because within the bones they have the DNA. They have blue eyes. They have blue eyes and dark skin. So that is uh, some of the earliest uh, modern humans that migrated out of, of Africa. And so those are the earliest ones. They would have given rise to the uh, uh, Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon. So I had the piece of, I had to, to go ahead here, but Cro-Magnon would have had originally dark skin and blue eyes, perhaps. But they came out of Africa. And so um, we have, you know, this the modern humans ventured out of Africa pretty early on. Um, and they went to Central Asia and then pretty much all around the world. About 20,000 years ago, they went across the Bering Land Bridge and made it over into the Americas as well. And so we've spread out across the entire world. Now that's a survival spread strategy, if you will. Um, so Homo sapiens, the earliest skulls, like 20, 90,000 years ago for, for one end out of Israel here. It was earlier ones, obviously, but they're just not well preserved usually. And remember, it takes special circumstances in order to preserve any sort of fossil whatsoever. In the next slide, you can actually see a Homo sapiens here out of the Dordogne Valley. 
uh, 30,000 years ago in France. It was discovered in 1868. This is an example of a, a somebody who would have probably died. They had an infection of some sort, and you can actually see the bone has been um, kind of wrinkled here. Uh, it shows that there was some sort of infection in this individual, but they made it. They survived. Um, they find you know evidence for trepany in some of the early humans as well. So they did brain surgery on some of the early humans. Um, the next one's a slide from uh, Indonesia. This is one of the early Homo sapiens as well. Age is kind of uncertain there, but you can see that the skull, we lack the protruding eyebrows that were more common in some of the earlier forms of humans here. Um, although you do find it, in fact, some in some Homo sapiens, so the protruding eyebrow is not just you know, something that's reserved for Neanderthals, in fact. Now, interestingly enough, okay, so the Homo sapiens did some of the early cave painting. Uh, some of the cave painting goes back about 40,000 years. Here you can see some from 32 to 10,000 years ago. And so it shows you that there's this sort of capacity for understanding art and for communicating all the way back then. And so there probably was language that developed even for the Neanderthals. Uh, although they, there is some question as to how much uh, air volume they could pass through their vocal cords. Uh, so there may have been a, a sort of primitive uh, verbal communication even amongst the uh, Neanderthals, but certainly among the humans, we would have had verbal communication skills. I'd never claimed that any of my own were very, <laughs> very good, but, uh, but certainly it's good to know. I mean, that's one of the things that makes us humans. We're able to communicate with one another. Uh, on the next slide, you can see uh, the Homo uh, florinensis. They, they regard it as a slightly different uh, species, and some people would actually draw it out of the Homo erectus branch. And so they may have predated the, the migration of modern humans to Indonesia. Uh, you can see a, a photo of this, the cavern where it was discovered. And here they show you that poten potential for actually having been derived from a Homo erectus sort of uh, common ancestry, perhaps, as opposed to being a, a Homo sapien. But they lived, you know, relatively recent on the island of Flores and uh, were found there. And so modern humans, we have this capacity, okay, 1.5 to 2.1 percent uh, Homo neanderthalensis genes in us. Uh, so East Asia has the most, 20 percent of that genome exists. I guess I said earlier that it was slightly more than that, but uh, one of the other early human branches was Denosovan, and that's the, uh, the reconstructions at the bottom here. At the top, you can see Neanderthalensis, and here you can see some humans at the very bottom of on the right-hand side as well. So you tell me. I mean, it's like, are we really human, I guess, is the, the question, you know. It's like, are we a combination of all these things that were before us? Um, so what makes us human? Was it when the language developed, or is humanity something that's wider? Is it when we care for one another? And so, you know, maybe I shouldn't have included that slide of, of the, of the sent from St. Louis here. I, it, it makes me very upset, okay? But, you know, at the same time, it's like you should be outraged as well, okay? So those were guns that were held to defend property as opposed to defend the rights and, and privileges that are given to every common human being that we know of. And so that was a, a protest that was going on in these folks that felt it was within their rights to uh, to defend themselves in some way. Or I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't. In fact, I don't agree with that. But uh, because it was a peaceful protest, and the people need to realize that there are certain inalienable human rights that need to be observed. Um, so. Anyway, what makes us human? And so I launch into this afterwards, and I, you've already known this. There have been some enormous uh, human suffering, human tragedies that were generated by humans. We, okay, so if we look at the great sins of, of the human race, slavery is one of those great sins. Um, murder, of course, war is even more so. Uh, the great sins of humanity. And, uh, you know, the, the potential for annihilating other human beings. So the Native Americans, are, it's been estimated that roughly 8 million Native Americans were taken out in pre, you know, the, after Columbus. And so from pre-Columbian days to um, Christopher Columbus arriving and, you know, the arrival of 
colonists into the uh, western western reaches of our planet. Uh, in Congo, in the 1900s, uh, this was would it be this would have been a, a, a colony from Belgium, uh, the Congo. Uh, there were it's estimated eight and a half million people lost their lives there. In China in the 1900s, the early 1900s, 800,000 people were killed in uh, certain events. Um, and I'm not just talking about earthquakes and things like that. These are human-derived events. Um, in the 1930s, they did the same thing uh, during the, uh, you know, the, the, the Japanese had invaded China and China, in order to stop the Japanese, opened the floodgates on some of their reservoirs in the Yellow River and it killed close to three million people. Uh, Stalin is credited, credited, um, is attributed as having killed a roughly two, 20 million people uh, during his purges uh, in the 1920s and 1930s in the Soviet Union. Um, there was a genocide a hundred years ago this year in Armenia where the Turks uh, attacked uh, Armenians and roughly they killed the Syrians as well who were um, from a little bit farther south from Armenia there and killed about one and a half million people. Um, the Russian Revolution alone killed about nine million people. World War I was huge for killing people as well. But World War II, it, did, it paled in comparison to the 55 million people who were killed in World War II. War is bad. <laughs> War is extremely bad. And in fact, if you just take um, the, the Jewish Holocaust, six million people were killed in the Jewish Holocaust. And there are survivors that can say, yes, this happened. It did happen. Um, yeah, the Japanese, when they invaded China, they killed 200,000 people in one city in Nanjing. And, um, and we're not immune to that being Americans either. Uh, in order to precipitate the end of World War II, Harry Truman dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan. Um, nobody deserves to be annihilated, I guess. Um, 220,000 people were killed by the nuclear bombs. And uh, even when Britain pulled out of India, their colony India, they divided it into East Pakistan, West Pakistan, and India. And so India was more or less the home for most of the Hindu populations in the Southern, South Asian super subcontinent. And then Pakistan was on either side. And that's where many of the um, Muslim population from India had to leave and go. And so they called this partition, um, the partitioning of, uh, of India. And so there were roughly 500,000 people that were killed in that event. Two and a half million people, uh, North Koreans, South Koreans, Chinese, and Americans were killed in the Korean War. Um, as if that weren't bad enough, there were a lot more people that died in the 1970s, after the Vietnam War, now if you look at the Vietnam War, there's roughly about 60,000 Americans that were killed. We have a monument to, uh, to, to honor the war dead from that, um, from that military event. It was never really an official war. It was called a police action, I think, just as the Korean War was never officially a war in our terminology. It certainly was in the North Korean terminology. Um, so in for the 60,000 Americans that were killed in the Vietnam War, there were estimated probably 2 million um, Vietnamese that were killed. I mean, they're all the same people. In North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese, it's the same. Um, and today that's one country again. After the Vietnam War, now Saigon fell in 1975, and today that's Ho Chi Minh City. He was a, a hero to the North uh, Vietnamese. Um, after that, there was a, um, a dictator that went in to Cambodia and he took over Cambodia as a communist. And he killed roughly 200,000 people. For instance, if you wore glasses, he would shoot you. Uh, if you could, you know, if you had a, 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 were teachers, you would be killed. If you were a doctor, you would be killed. Anybody with an education, in other words. And so... It was a great leveling out in Cambodia, and they estimate there were roughly 200,000, well, excuse me, 2 million uh, people that died of starvation during that occupation 
of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Um, and today, you know, Vietnam has recovered. Cambodia has recovered. They still recall um, these events. They were really horrific uh, events. And of course, intelligence is not handed down from generation to generation. So very many folks have, you know, are now doctors and lawyers and things like that in Cambodia. And Cambodia is a, a thriving community again. Uh, and Vietnam is as well. And Vietnam has, has recovered um, from the war, mostly. One of the sad things is it still kills people every day. Okay, so one of the things that human beings developed was landmines. And so landmines are still out in places in Laos, in Cambodia, in Vietnam. And so there are still people that are killed by the Vietnam War. You know, not during that era, however. In, in Rwanda and Burundi in the 1990s, uh, there were genocides that were carried on between the Hutu and the Tutsi. And so there were 1.35 million people killed then as well. Um, it was Stalin, in fact, who said at one point, you know, the death of any individual is a tragedy. But the death of many millions of people is just a statistic. I want to disagree with that, but so often times we don't get a chance to express that. I've never had to live through anything like that myself, uh, although the pandemic is right up there with this. We've had two and a half, uh, two, 250,000 people die during this pandemic just in the United States. And so roughly, I think worldwide, it's around two, two and a half million. Uh, so one out of 10 people that have died roughly are from the United States. Um, yeah, that could have been prevented, you know, uh, with the proper actions. And so there were footballs that got dropped all along the way uh, during this pandemic. And so, you know, and uh, everybody is still sweating out whether we're all going to survive this or not. We don't know. Um, on the next slide, this is the last slide, and this is the culmination of this course. And we talked about this in class. So I, don't want to beat a dead horse, but here we are in the middle of um, this wonderful world, the, the blue planet that we have. And it's had this long and remarkable history of evolution and the flowering of plants and animals, especially over the last 500 million years here. Um, in the, you know, 5,000 years ago, human beings were able to create some of the most incredible monuments just by ourselves, right? So like the pyramids. We were able to fly as early as the 1700s. We were able to harness electricity and energy to cook with, to heat with. And so before that, you had to burn things in order to stay warm or to cook your food, which would lead to a healthier people, right? And so we were able to harness electricity. We were able to harness the energy from uh, fossil fuels as well. In 1903, we got to fly in Kitty Hawk in, uh, in North Carolina. And, and so in the 1940s, computers were developed. And then so by the 19, that was during World War II and, and code cracking, you know, that gave us the, the computer. And so by 1969, we were able to visit the moon for the first time and land there. It's the only other planetary body that we as human beings have ever touched the soil of. And so when we landed on the moon in 1969, we left in like 19, mid 1970s and we never went back. And so hopefully we'll go back within your lifetime again to some of these other planets and maybe we make, make it to Mars. It's, it remains to be seen whether that's going to happen in my lifetime or not, but hopefully within your lifetime, we'll have manned missions to Mars as well. We build these incredible structures. Here's 707 meters high, the Burj Dubai, you know, in Abu Dhabi. And it's like, it's just a, an incredible sort of feat of human engineering and technology. We have this great capacity to do wonderful things. And we kind of, we have a tendency also to screw things up. So um, anyway, that's the, the culmination of this course is really to give you a chance to hold the mirror to yourself. And it's like, what can I do to help? You know, what can I do to make this a better world? What can I do to at least preserve the things that we have 
in order to, you know, you know, keep things from going extinct. You know, we don't want to be the sixth extinction, even though people would claim that we already are uh, by destroying the, the, the by destroying the the rainforests in Brazil and other places around the world and harvesting the trees. And, and uh, so it behooves us to like, if we have this knowledge to try to address that, well, how do you do it? You do it through governments and governments. A lot of people think are a bad thing, you know, but governments are designed to do the things that an individual cannot do and that corporations don't want to do because there's no profit motive in it. So how do we do that? How do we get people behind government once again? How do we turn people into good citizens? Well, Missouri State really does a pretty good job of that because that's one of the pillars that we have, right? Community engagement, uh, you know, cultural competency, and then ethical leadership as well. So ethics are really big in this thing. And so uh, if I were to encourage you to do anything in the future, other than study your geology and become a really good geologist, you know, and maintain and keep this understanding of the history that goes behind this, because if, if if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. So there are things that we don't want to repeat in history. And so it behooves us to be active, to be participants in this great experiment of life on this planet. And so we don't know if there's life elsewhere. I like to think that probably there is at some point, but there's no knowing that. And so if at some point we can find out if there is life elsewhere, that'll be great. Whether we can actually reach out to it, I doubt um, significantly in the next 100 or 200 or 300 years even uh, that we'll be able to do that. But, you know, it's like at the same time, it's like it's good to know that we're not alone. There is a purpose on this planet, and that purpose is to help other people find their purpose and then also to make it easier on everybody right so you know i guess you know yeah be it be a good be a good citizen be a good citizen and try to improve things if you can anyway that's it for this course and thank you so much for being a part of historical geology i really think it's an important class um because i can give other folks a different perspective on the deep history the deep time that we have uh experienced on this planet anyway thanks a lot for your attention thanks for your attendance and thanks for uh, well, taking the final. The final will be coming up here just shortly here. And this will be a part of it, of course, as well. So anyway, thanks a lot. I'll see you soon, hopefully next semester. So take care. Bye now.